Section timestamps are in this video's description. Before we texture our track, we should prepare the surface first. Click the little arrow next to Track Configuration, Track, then click Track Floor. Scroll down the Unity Inspector pane until you see Shader. Use the drop down to select Ballistic NG's old school shader called Vertex Lit Double Sided. Put simply, a shader is just a program that determines how textures are drawn, kind of like an Instagram filter. Do the same for the track wall. Let's go ahead and select our pad textures. Click Ballistic NG, Track Editor, Atlas, Textures, New Texture. Click the black square under Diffuse and select a texture for your boost pads. Do the same for your weapon and spawn pads. Set the textures to be drawn on your pads by clicking Tiles and then clicking the small rectangles under your three new textures. Set the textures to be drawn on your pads by clicking Tiles and then clicking the small rectangles under your three new textures. WPNRP means Weapon Replacement, which is drawn during game modes that disallow weapons. Click the small arrows next to Scene Configuration and Managers. Then click the Track Data List item. Finally, click the Force Atlas Update and Force Tile Update buttons. You can also paint multiple track textures onto your track.
left click the square showing you a new track texture, then left click tiles on the track to paint. An awesome track needs an environment, kind of like a forest, a lake, or outer space. Blender is a program that can create environments. You can skip this section by checking this video's description. Okay, great. We can now start creating our environment. Go ahead and open up Blender. Don't worry about all the crazy buttons in this program. I'll be going slow commentating my every move, and keeping everything simple so that you don't have to go through what I went through. Left click empty space to close the splash screen. Before we create Crisis 3, we should import our track so that we can build around it. Go ahead and open up Ballistic NG's track editor. Open your track. We want the CTS file, not the TRK file. Please be careful here. You want to export it as a OBJ file not a TRM file. All 
Alright, excellent. Let's get out of here and hop into Blender again. Let us begin the ritual of importing our track into Blender. Firstly, right click the cube to select it. Then press the spacebar on your keyboard. Secondly, type in delete. Thirdly, left click the delete menu item. Fourthly, click file. Import. Wavefront.obj Fifthly, open up your Ballistic NG MyTrax folder. I am showing the URL on the screen right now. Sixthly, click the floor OBJ file. Then click Import OBJ. Nice work. We now have our floor in Blender. Do the same for the wall file. You can rotate your view by holding the middle mouse button. You can zoom using your mouse's scroll wheel. If your mouse doesn't have a scroll wheel, you can also use the plus and minus keys on your keypad. You can pan by holding shift, middle mouse, and moving your cursor. Let's add a floor to our map. Click the small create tab in the top left. Plane. Sometimes zooming will become very slow in Blender. You can reset the zoom speed by using the decimal point keypad key on your keyboard to focus on the object you are trying to zoom in on. Let's make it bigger. Click the small tools tab in the top left. Then left click the scale button once. Then keep moving your cursor towards the left to make it bigger. Left click when it's big enough to stop scaling. You can click and drag the three colored arrows to move the floor into the center of the map and just below your track. Now that our floor is done, let's chuck it into Unity. File Export FBX Please be careful here. Make sure you click FBX, not 
OBJ. Navigate to your Unity Assets folder. I am showing my folder location on the screen right now. Export FBX. Finally, bring the Unity window to the foreground. You will now notice your Blender object in the bottom pane. Click and drag it into the 3D world. Set the position to 0, 0, 0. When you move your Unity camera around, you should see a strange grey colour flickering on your track. This means you exported your Blender mesh successfully. If you do not see grey flickering when you move your camera around, please ensure the position is exactly 0, 0, 0, and that you imported your track into Blender earlier on. Finish the job by deleting everything in this new object, except the plane object. The ritual is now complete. Let's check it out by saving our Unity scene and building the track. Our floor is okay, but we can do better. Let's create some basic mountain terrain. Firstly, we'll chop the big square up into smaller squares. Then we will move some smaller squares upwards to form mountains. Firstly, ensure the big floor is selected by right clicking it. We need to edit this square to chop it up, but we're currently in something called object mode. Click the drop down in the bottom left, and then click edit mode. Alright, awesome. We're now in edit mode. So now we can start editing objects, such as our square. 
Just remember that object mode is for moving objects and edit mode is for editing objects. Hit spacebar and type in subdivide. Left click the subdivide list item. Left click the tiny right arrow under number of cuts until we get all the way up to six. Ensure your selection mode is vertex by left clicking the leftmost tiny square next to the word global. Vertex basically means dot. Hold to shift and right click every second dot along the edge. Click and drag the blue up arrow to move the dots up. Finally, select some of these elevated dots and just lower them slightly. Click File, Export, FBX, and ensure to override the same FBX file that you saved into a Unity project beforehand. Bring Unity back into the foreground. You will notice the Unity scene refresh to show your recent changes. This is okay, but we could use something a little more close to the track. Let's create some overhanging structures. We need to create a cube, but we're, in, we're currently in edit mode. Click the drop down in the bottom left, and then click object mode. We need to edit this cube, so use the bottom left drop down to hop into edit mode again. Switch from vertex select mode to face select mode by clicking the third little small square button next to the word global. Then use the arrow to move the face outward. Do the same for the other side. Once again, we need to move this object, but we're currently in edit mode. 
So just hop back into object mode and move this object slightly above the track. We can repeat this process again to create the left and right sides of our structure. Ensure your object is selected by right clicking it, press spacebar and type in duplicate objects. See if you can create the left and right sides of the structure without looking at this video. Nice work, we're going to create three of these, but before we start duplicating stuff, let's glue our three cubes together to form one whole object. Select all three cubes by holding shift on your keyboard and right clicking all three cubes. Press spacebar, type in join. and then left click the join list item. Go ahead and create two more overhanging structures by using the duplicate command in the three arrows. I can't wait to try this out. Start off by exporting these objects into your Unity project again. But where's our hung where's our overhanging structures? When you first put the model into Unity's 3D world, you deleted everything except the plane. 
Whilst Unity auto refreshes objects in the 3D world, it will not auto refresh stuff that is not in the 3D world. To solve this, we just have to join our three overhanging structures and our mountain terrain to make one very big object. Firstly, hold shift and right click the three overhanging structures and the terrain. Secondly, use the spacebar to execute the make duplicates real command. Thirdly, execute the convert to command. Then the mesh from curve command. And finally, execute the join command. Re export it into your Unity project again and check out your three new overhanging structures. Don't worry if you found the four steps confusing. You will eventually memorize them off by heart, and you're always welcome to come back to this video in the future. It's time to texture our models, but first, we need to create the textures. A texture atlas is just a grid of textures. To create a grid of textures, or texture atlas, we will need something more powerful than Microsoft Paint. You can skip this section by checking this video's description. Firstly, we will create a big blank image to hold all our textures in a grid format. Then we will create three very simple textures and put them into the big image. Let's start off by creating the big image. Click File, New. Set the width and height to 1024. Click OK. This is the big image that we will use to hold our grid of textures.
let's create texture number one. File. New. Set the width and height to 512. You can fill the canvas with a solid color using the Paint Bucket tool. Click the Paint Bucket button. Choose a rusty color. And then left click the canvas to fill it. You are also free to experiment with the brush tool. Click File, New, and repeat the process to create texture number 2. Set the width of the third texture to 1024 and the height to 512.
Okay, great. We now have three textures. We can now put our three textures into a grid formation. Click the square selection button. Then select the whole image by click and dragging from the top left, all the way to the bottom right. Edit, copy, edit, paste. Repeat for the other two textures. Click and drag inside selected areas to move them. And you can also use the arrow keys on your keyboard to move the selected areas more precisely. Finish off the job by saving it as a PNG file. Now that we have our textures, we can now apply them in Blender using an add-on. To use our grid of textures in Blender, we will use a free Blender add-on called Spry Tile. You can skip this section by checking this video's description. Now that the add-on is downloaded, we can install it. File User Preferences Then click the Install From File button.
click the all button on the left then type in spry tile into the search bar i'm showing the spelling on my screen right now you will now see spry tile painter on the right this means you installed the add-on successfully blender add-ons are actually disabled by default so go ahead and enable it by clicking the checkbox Now that we have Spry Tile installed, we are ready to paint using our Texture Atlas. And before we continue, I'd actually recommend saving your Blender project here. Let's prepare our object to be painted on. Firstly, use the drop down in the bottom left to ensure you are in object mode. Secondly, click the silver circle on the right. Thirdly, click the new button. Fourthly, click the small sprite tile tab on the left. And finally, click the set material to shadeless button. Nice work. Now let's open up our texture atlas image. Click the chessboard button on the right. And a second silver circle button will appear underneath. Ensure it is selected. New Open Select your texture apps image and click Open Image Finally, click the Setup Pixel Texture button on the left we are currently in object mode, but to paint using Sprite Tile, we actually need to be in edit mode. Click the drop down at the bottom left and select edit mode. Click the paint button at the top to start painting. <laughs> Please note. Okay, so. Sprite tile add-on, it's still in early development, so sometimes it just explodes in your face and like your keyboard will catch on fire. You, you'll see like a whole list of just warning icons all over your screen <laughs> with like all different kinds of cryptic messages in Russian or something. When this happens, all you have to do is reset the add-on by double clicking the paint button at the top twice. But just trust me, the add-on is still pretty good and it, it, it does a job. Your grid of textures, or texture atlas, is in the bottom right. Before we paint, we should set Sprite Tiles settings. There are two text boxes on the left, next to Grid Size. Use them to set the grid size to 1024 by 512. Click the stretch X and stretch Y and hinting checkboxes. Go ahead and paint the terrain. Start off by left clicking the 1024 by 512 texture in the texture atlas. Then you just have to left click squares on the screen to apply the texture. 
always angle your camera so that it is directly facing the square you want to paint on. If the terrain is black, click the silver circle on the right. Then click the shadeless checkbox. Continue left clicking squares until the entire terrain is painted. Go ahead and paint the overhanging structures. The terrain texture we are currently using, or whatever you have selected, is 1024 wide, 512 high. But the other two textures are 512 wide, 512 high. So to select the other textures, we just need to tell Sprite Tile to use a 512 by 512 grid. Use the text boxes on the left to do this. Click texture number 2 from your texture atlas and start painting the overhanging structures. Always angle, and I mean always, always angle your camera so that it is directly facing the square you want to paint on. You can rotate painted textures by changing the grid rotation text box. Once you're done, export the model by saving over the same FBX file in your Unity project folder. Right click the cube in the bottom pane, then left click show in explorer. In another window, navigate to your texture atlas image. Copy it over to your unity project folder. Then bring the Unity window into the foreground. Great work so far. So to make this file usable, we need to tweak some settings first. Left click your texture atlas in the bottom pane.
check the read write enabled checkbox on check the generate MIP maps checkbox set the filter mode to point no filter then just click the small apply button finally click and drag the texture atlas image onto the model to tell it to use that image as the texture atlas You can also get the old school Ballistic NG look by just telling the model to use Ballistic NG's shader. Run the Vertex Light Mapper so that your light settings affect your model. Then, save your scene and check out your environment. While the game loads, I'll explain why the model was still grey in Unity after painting the model in Blender. Every time you clicked a square in Blender, you, weren't, you, you were not actually painting a texture. Instead, you were actually just telling the model to map that square to a specific part of an image. You then exported this mapping information into Unity when you exported the model because the information was secretly stored inside the model file itself by a sprite tile. Hence, the model was still great because even though the mapping information was there, the model had no actual image to use. The squares were basically being mapped to an empty image. When you drag the image file onto the model, you told the model to use that image. The mapping information for each square combined with the image resulted in a textured model. A video consists of frames. An animation consists of frames. The timeline at the bottom consists of frames. The green line shows what frame you're currently viewing. You can click and drag this green line to move it around. Let's create an animated floating cube. Firstly, click and drag the green line to frame 0, which is the earliest frame. Ensure the cube is selected by right clicking it. Since we will be moving an object, we need to be in object mode again. Ensure you are in object mode by clicking the bottom left drop down. Space bar. Insert keyframe menu. Then select lock rot scale. Lock rot scale or location rotation and scale means to record the location, rotation, and scale of our object as a new frame. You should see a yellow bar underneath the timeline's green bar. This means you added a new frame successfully, and we can continue adding more frames. Drag the green line up to frame 50 in our animation. Move the cube up. Then once again, use spacebar to record a new frame.
drag the green line up to frame 100 in our animation, move the cube back down, and then once again use spacebar to record a new frame. Alright, awesome work. You just created your first animation. You can see it in action by dragging the green line from frame 0 to frame 100. Looking at the end text box at the bottom, we can see that our animation has a total of 250 frames. But since we only used 100, let's update the total frame count from 250 to 100. Left click the end text box and type in 100. Now that our animation is done, let's export this animation into Unity. The animation is secretly stored inside our model file. So we just need to export the model file like normal. Make sure to save it in your Unity Projects Assets folder. I am showing my path on the screen right now. And please be careful here. Make sure to put in a new name for this model. Otherwise, you'll be saving over the model we created before. Now that our animated model is in Unity, let's put our floating cube into the 3D world. Start off by bringing the Unity window into the foreground. Click and drag the cube from the bottom pane into the 3D world. Let's check out the cube in action by moving the main camera object so that it can actually see the cube. Future hopes of working at Pixar are over. We will have to change some settings to get our animation working. Firstly, look at the bottom pane and click the small arrow next to your cube. You should see a gunmetal rectangle with a play symbol in the middle. This means your animation was exported with your model. If you don't see it, please ensure your inserted keyframes in Blender and that you exported your model as a new file by giving it a new name. Secondly, click the Rig button on the right. Thirdly, click the drop down next to Animation Type and set it to Legacy. Fourthly, click the Apply button. Now our animation is set up correctly. Make sure of this by selecting your cube in the 3D world and checking the animation text box on the right. It should say something like cube action. If it doesn't, please drag the gunmetal rectangle with a play icon from the bottom pane into the text box. You can loop the animation by clicking the floating cube in the bottom pane. Animations. and then setting the wrap mode to loop.
what a masterpiece. I feel like verifying its awesomeness by playing the track. Click the small arrow next to Scene Configuration. Click the small arrow next to Managers, Scene References. Then set the weather and bloom to whatever you want. Click Game Object, Audio, Audio Source. The blue circle surrounding the icon is a range. Plays need to be inside the blue circle to hear it. You can increase the range by click and dragging one of the tiny blue circles outward. Let's set the sound. Click the small circle next to audio clip. Then click crowd. Ensure the play on awake and loop checkboxes are checked, otherwise the sound may not play. Drag the slider next to spatial blend all the way to the right. 2D spatial blend means you can hear it anywhere in the map, whereas 3D means you need to be close to the actual audio source to hear it. Click the text box next to audio clip. Click the crowd file in the bottom pane and ensure the load in background and pre-load audio data checkboxes are actually checked. Otherwise all the audio sources using this sound file will play erratically at maximum volume when your track loads. And as always, don't forget to hit the apply button. Game object, light, point light. A point light is basically a light bulb. You can click the white rectangle on the right to change its color. Run the vertex light mapper again to bake these new pre-computed light values into the map file. If your new lighting isn't visible, try darkening your ambient color by clicking window, lighting, settings.
Mr. Shark, comrade. I already covered adding a sky dome in part 1. Tell your sky dome to use the unlit texture shader. Click add component, type in light mapping. Select light mapping options. Then ensure the ignore light mapper checkbox is checked. Also ensure the cast shadows and receive shadows checkboxes are not checked. Fix black skies by setting the shade up back to unlit texture. Game object, create empty, add component, reflection probe. A reflection probe is basically a camera, much like taking panorama sh shots with a smartphone camera app. It works by taking pictures from different angles and then combining them into one picture. This one picture is then drawn onto the ship to make it look like it has a reflective surface. The cube surrounding the reflection probe indicates what is included in its photos. The final combined photo will only be drawn onto the ship if the ship is inside this cube. You can change the cube by clicking the three dot button and dragging the tiny yellow squares. Add reflection probes where you want ship reflections. Sometimes you just find that you can't drag the yellow square past a certain point. Fix this by clicking the arrows button on the right. and changing the probe's camera position. You can mark areas on the map to make a swoosh sound when players drive over it at fast speeds. 
You can mark areas on the map to make a splash effect when players drive over it. Um, this, I, I guess I should say that this splash effect is used in Clyde's Bridge to simulate turbulence in dark tunnels, and also to simulate snow particles getting pushed into the air when driving by. Firstly, ensure you are logged into Steam. Secondly, ensure that Steam is not in offline mode. Thirdly, ensure that the Ballistic NG game is closed. You can only have the game and this track upload or open at a single point in time. Navigate to your Ballistic NG folder. I am showing the path on my screen right now. Open the Modding and Track Uploader folders. Run Ballistic NG Track Uploader.exe as admin. Click your track name on the left, then click Convert to Workshop File on the right. Click Select Image to set a thumbnail for your workshop item. Please note that thumbnails must be PNG files, and as a general rule, square images look better. I'll just quickly create one now. Click the Update Track button to upload your track file. If you already uploaded a track to the workshop, this button can also be used to safely update your track file without changing any other details like the thumbnail. Navigate to your Ballistic NG My Tracks folder, select your track, then hit Open. And why not add a title and description? Click the plus button. Type in track. And click OK. This will allow other people to see your track easier. When you're ready to upload, hit the save button first. And then hit the upload button. This can take a couple minutes, depending on your track complexity. For example, if you have like a really high res 2048, 2048 textures with no compression, um, that will increase the track size significantly. And also your internet speed will affect this. After clicking OK, your browser will automatically open to your workshop file. OK, and I think that covers most things. Um, at least covered the life cycle of a full track, so from start to end. So you create the track mesh in the Ballistic NG track editor, then you export that mesh into Unity, and then you make it a functional track using Ballistic NG Unity tools.
and creating a model, texturing it, and other stuff to add ambience into the track, such as lighting, uh, and then uploading to the Steam Workshop. So I, I created this video so that future people don't have to go through the head scratching that I went through. I'm certain that you can create great new tracks with your new skills, and I look forward to people sharing their tracks, sharing their creativity through the Steam Workshop, growing their track base and making the game even more awesome. I hope this video helped you heaps, leave a thumbs up if this tutorial helped you out, Otherwise, leave a thumbs down so that I know how to make better future tutorials. Cheers.